think a lot of us thought that this was going to be the only Final Fantasy VII game we got on mobile. Because, well, that's what we were told. So it came as quite a big shock when Final Fantasy VII, in its entirety, popped up on the App Store on Thursday. We spent the weekend having a play, having a poke, trying to really get to grips with the mobile version of the game to give you what we like to think is the definitive review of the mobile version. Now, it has its problems. It has its quirks. Um, a lot of those quirks stem from what the game was to start with, what the game still is. But a lot of the quirks uh, stem from what you can see on screen right now, which is the control scheme, uh, which we're going to get into in a little more detail in a while. So as you can see, this is the, a direct part of the PC game. The textures have been smoothed off a little from the PS1 originals. I mean, this is a game that came out in 1997 originally. This is a game that's older than quite a lot of you listening to this. Is it worth the money? Yes and no. Let's delve a bit deeper into the things that make Final Fantasy VII on mobile. Final Fantasy VII on mobile. Okay. So, if you don't know what Final Fantasy VII is, I'm, you know, here's a bit of a potted history. This is basically the, the, the game that broke JRPGs in the West. Um, that's kind of simplified terms. There are games, JRPGs, that came out in the West before. Um, but this is a huge release of the PS1 era. It was also one of the most returned games of the PS1 era. For reasons that sort of still stand now, it's a, it's a huge sprawling chaotic thing without really that much to do i mean there's lots to do there's a colossal amount to do but there's um the the the, the core fighting mechanics as it were are a lot more tactical a lot more thought out this isn't an action game i mean it has action game segments we just saw one with a motorbike but it's not Tomb Raider. It's not Mario 64. It's not that level. Um, so, the, the game is about... if Well, it, it can go on for hundreds and hundreds of hours if you put your back into playing everything. Uh, you are, your main character here is Cloud. He of the spiky blonde hair. Um, and it's interesting to look back at, at Cloud now with sort of eyes that have experienced almost 20 years worth of JRPGs in the meantime that he's sort of the proto angsty hero but he's actually a really interesting character at the same time he's he's a troubled young man um, TM but he's an interestingly troubled young man he's a troubled young man who's not just pouting and brooding and as you sort of work your way through his story and you find out what's happened to him again it's very affecting this is a, a surprisingly affecting video game to be honest i mean half of the characters you meet in the first hour are dead by this point they have been uh, uh crushed to death by an evil corporation and it's got that cyberpunk grimness to it as well. I mean, there are just giant streaks of blood running through this level. Um, but it did cyberpunk grimness very well. Um, it's the, the first few hours you spend in, uh, in Midgar are dirty and full of wreckage and broken people. And it's it sets its scene wonderfully. But now we're going to have a look at some of the things... That have changed in this mobile version so this is one of sort of the big boss fights of of the first part of final fantasy 7 i remember getting stuck on this now normally you wouldn't have hp 9999 mp 999 and be at level 99 at this point but this mobile version well it lets you instantly boost your stats to full so all of your characters are as strong as they can possibly be. And there's no way to take that back either. Um, and the other thing you can do is turn off random encounters. Now random encounters are almost the backbone of the JRPG. They are how you how you grow your characters 
with experience, how you get new items, how you um, aren't just wandering around a map all the time, but here you can turn them off entirely. And obviously the trade-off of that is you have to be able to jump to a higher level, because otherwise, if you didn't have those random um, random battles turned on, then you just die within a few hours because you wouldn't be strong enough to deal with what the game was throwing at you. Um, and, and, and this battle in particular exposes the frailty um, uh, of that of having introduced those systems because this is a very difficult battle. The three characters you have um, only only Barrett at that point can actually hit the uh, monster with anything other than. Um, magic or grenades so it, it it's an interesting mechanic because in the original at that point the game is forcing you to learn and position your characters into roles so you can't just have everyone attacking you have to have a healer you have to have someone using items you have to learn what the different things do and it works really well if you manage to get past it which I know a lot of people didn't but here you can just be level 999 shoot it with your gun once and it's dead. And it's it's an interesting decision. It's it's flawed from one perspective, but if you want to just play through the game, if you want to experience the story, and the story is a huge, massive part of this game, there is a... Like, when I'd finished Final Fantasy VII, I didn't really play another Final Fantasy until... 10 because it just felt like I was kind of betraying the characters um, which sounds weird but like I was it felt like I was betraying the characters that I'd, I'd taken through this massive adventure by playing another game that was sort of a bit like it um, and you don't really get that connection with the characters because everything's so easy for them they, they they feel like superheroes already and that's that's one of the problems with it and the other problem which we're going to talk about now is um, Square Enix's decision to overlay an entire controller over the screen um, and it doesn't well sort of works a bit a bit Okay, so let's deal with these controls. We're on the world map at the moment, and as you've probably seen already in the video, the entire screen is is covered with buttons. Um, it's, it basically represents the buttons from a PS1 controller. Different names, slightly different layout. You've got your selects at either side, and your uh, these are your triggers along the top. Um, it's very clunky. Um, not bad to play with particularly um the d-pads are right i mean like i've said before final fantasy 7 is nearly 20 years old um it doesn't have the best controls to start off with but if you've played any of uh, square enix's other mobile ports of final fantasy games or even the likes of the chaos ring series um then you're going to be a bit uncomfortable with this so uh, i've got counters off at the moment but i'm going to pop them on and i'm going to show you how uh, everything works in combat as well. Now, as I've said before, I am uh, super duper up to my levels, so this isn't going to be a challenging fight whatsoever because I'm like as high a level as you can get. So, these menus are basically perfect for touchscreen controls, um, but you can't use it. So, you've got to tap on your D pad to move up and down, so we're controlling Cloud at the moment. You've got your attack magic item. So let's attack one of these beasts. Same with Aeris here, she doesn't have any materia equipped at the moment. Um, but again, attack, uh, but there, there's even a finger pointing at the things and it just makes you want to poke stuff. It makes you wish that rather than, the game feels a bit like an emulator. This has all been overlaid on top and it's a, a an easy and quick way of making what is essentially an incredibly good game, playable on mobile, and it is playable, don't get me wrong, it's not, it's not broken, it's not, you know, it's not Tomb Raider 2 levels of terribleness, but 
it doesn't feel like we're getting the very best Final Fantasy VII experience that we could get on mobile, and that's a real shame. It feels like someone at Square Enix has said, we can make Final Fantasy VII on mobile, but don't touch it. Don't do anything strange to it. Don't make it... Because people are going to get angry if you change anything. And maybe they would have got angry, but I just... I, I feel that this could have been a port that actually... Was more than a port. Was a... A version. Um, on a par with the PS1 version and with the, with the, with the PC version. Um, that came out in the past. But as it stands, it's a slightly broken way of playing Final Fantasy VII. It's still wonderfully entertaining. It's still got all the charm and the excitement of Final Fantasy VII that certain people are going to know and certain people are going to come to the first for the first time and go, "Wow, this is incredible." So, what is Final Fantasy VII Mobile then? It's Still a brilliant game, like I've said. The character designs are incredible. The world building is still as breathtaking as it was all those years ago. The bad guys that you fight and the characters that you'll meet and everything is just wonderfully engaging and in a way that you don't necessarily get on, on mobile. But... At the same time, the concessions that have been made for mobile, the tweaks and twists that have been kind of forced upon the game, mean it's not the perfect version. I mean, no one was expecting it to be the perfect version, but Square Enix has got form at this. Final Fantasy VI on mobile is brilliant. Final Fantasy IV on mobile is also brilliant. Chaos Rings 3 was brilliant. So to come back back to this almost it feels like an early attempt to port it when the app store was younger and we were all a bit more naive and so what we end up with is a game that it's easy to pick at it's easy to poke holes in it but just because of the encounters off system because of the instant leveling up because of the really really clumsy ugly controls that have been kind of jammed right onto the screen because we all know that mobile games can be better than that whether or not they can be better than the actual game underneath those controls underneath those problems well that's a different matter altogether now for me there is a there's a part of me that will always acknowledge final fantasy 7 as the pinnacle of the jrpg i i honestly don't think it got better after this Maybe it got m mechanically more interesting, maybe the stories got bigger, maybe the writing got better, but in terms of that sort of first experience, of, of that first involvement with the characters, of of that first... that Even just that first time a certain tune kicks in, these are, are the building blocks for me and for a lot of Western players of the JRPG, and so... This is our touchstone. This is our comparison piece. And I think if you'd have told me in 1997 that at some point I would be able to play Final Fantasy on my phone, I would have called you a lunatic. Because it was such an impressive production. It was it was way ahead of anything else that we'd experienced. And you know. And and for that alone, just for the fact that this now you know, fits on your phone or your tablet, you, you have to say, it's an incredible achievement. Is it as incredible an achievement as it could have been? No, probably not. But if you want to sit on a bus, or a train, or a plane if they let you have your phone on, and play Final Fantasy VII on your phone, then this is a really good version of it. Um, it's reasonably expensive, but it's not as expensive as some of us were probably thinking it was going to be. So, so it's good that we've got Final Fantasy VII on our phones. It's good that we get to experience this. And more importantly, it's good that a new generation of players get to experience this. Maybe they don't get to experience it in the best way, but that's life sometimes. This is still Final Fantasy VII. It's still brilliant. And if you've got the money, 
If you want to have a go, then you definitely should.